Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Sullivan. I'm the technical director at Sewer AI. I'm an underground construction professional. I specialize in infrastructure condition assessment and also in trenchless technology solutions. I have worked with several utilities, um, uh, consulting engineers, contractors over the years um, that I've been in our industry. I've been in our industry for a little over 13 years. Uh, I've worked as a business development manager, a national operations manager. Um, I've been a professional certification trainer for the National Association of Sewer Service Companies, NASCO, teaching the Pipeline Assessment Certification Program. Um, been leading those programs throughout North America uh, since 2012. I've been a CCTV operator and inspection system vacuum truck uh, technical sales representative as well. Um, and I've also been a project manager working for sewer services companies too. Um, and this is a uh, presentation on artificial intelligence in sewer condition assessment. Um, your questions are more than welcome, so uh, please uh, ask those questions through the uh, GoToWebinar uh, format and we'll see them pop up. Um, and at the end, uh, we'll address all those questions. So I'll just be going through the, uh, the material in the presentation um, as I have it here. So thanks everybody for attending. So to start off, I know this might be familiar to a lot of folks here, um, but America's wastewater infrastructure is aging. It's been given a D plus rating by the American Society for Civil Engineers in its most recent infrastructure report card. There are some massive funding gaps we're dealing with to the tune of about $100 billion, um, which is about two thirds of the total amount that you know, we would actually need to address our aging infrastructure. And you know the COVID-19 pandemic is only making that worse. Um, that's gonna equate to around, we think about 12 billion additional dollars in revenue loss for wastewater agencies. We know that when sewer pipes fail, it causes environmental spills and untreated wastewater, of course, when released into the environment causes public health risks. And then you also have with the collapse of sewer uh, infrastructure, sinkholes and they're dangerous and they're disruptive. So we're all pretty aware of that. And that's why most of us are here and why we're interested in new technologies and new solutions. Um, and the way this relates to CCTV con, uh, inspection and condition assessment is that, you know, we have, you know, pretty established uh, workflows currently for how we go about doing TV inspection. Um, we call that capture and assess. And what that means is that in the field, uh, the operator has a, uh, you know, pan and tilt CCTV crawler in a pipe. And in real time, they're driving the camera through the pipe and making observations as they go along. That's really the most common method that we've seen. Um, what we've noticed about that method is that about two thirds of the time, whenever a camera's in a pipe and a TV truck is set up on the street or at whatever access point, about two thirds of the time, the camera's actually um, idle and it's not moving, it's not collecting new data. Um, you also have, you know, because this is a manual uh, process that, you know, a human being is responsible for, you have quite a bit of subjectivity um, in terms of the reports, the quality of the reports, or the actual opinion itself that the operator's saying what's in the pipe or what's not in the pipe. And um, they can be incomplete sometimes, which we'll talk about in a second. Overall, we've noticed that there's a lot of aspects of this process, of this workflow that um, can have it be expensive and also slow, both slow in the field or slow in terms of getting the data into a format where it then can be uh, used and useful uh, by a decision maker such as an engineer or an asset manager. So we've had now for the last several decades um, in North America for the last uh, two decades almost um, is uh, the NASCO PACP, the Pipeline Assessment Certification Program. And then over in, uh, in the UK and in Europe, um, you have uh, the WRC, the Manual of Sewer Condition Classification. And um, especially with the PACP, there's a, there are 226 uh, unique codes. Uh, and, you know, for example, uh, there's seven distinct types of cracks and seven distinct types of fractures. Cracks and fractures are different from each other. Um, you know, being someone who is a, a NASCO PACP trainer, I'll say first off, it's, it's an amazing program. It provides a lot of um, tools for people to make decisions about what to do in a pipe, whether it's operation and maintenance or whether it's rehab or new construction. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that, you know, the operators who are being certified 
it's a two-day class and so you, as a trainer you have really two days with these people uh, they get a you know three and a half inch thick uh, manual that's got a lot of good examples and pictures and a lot of good information in it but it's it's a limited opportunity to really train and develop people and so from there they go out oftentimes into a camera truck into the field and they're expected to really be great at using the uh, the pipeline assessment certification program um, every day some are better than others some of the things that we were interested in some of the the questions that we were interested in answering um, when we initially undertook this process of developing artificial intelligence and applying it to condition assessment was uh, to what extent do you know different people agree with each other in condition assessment so for example if i had one video of one pipe and i showed it to any number of people how uh, many times will they agree with each other about you know different aspects of the condition of the pipe talk about that in a second also we wanted to know what is the accuracy uh, for when humans are doing this process and we noticed that to some extent these have been measured and, and oftentimes not um, there was a report that we uh, we we really liked um, that that gave us a lot of insight into this question um, it was put out two years ago in 2018 in Europe um, and it was in the uh, structure and infrastructure engineering uh, journal uh, I'll just read what it says here the results indicate that the probability to inspect correctly a pipe in poor condition is close to 80 percent and the probability to overestimate the condition of a pipe in bad condition which you could call a false negative or a missed defect is 20 percent we also were able to conduct um, an informal study on our own working with a large uh, sewer agency uh, where we had four individuals from that agency these are engineers uh, who are you know uh, certified individuals uh, you know using the PACP uh, program and uh, we gave them 13 videos of 13 different pipe segments and we had each of those four individuals code uh, condition assess that data set we also uh, ran our uh, artificial intelligence um, autocode uh, program on that same data set as well but what we found that we thought was interesting was that these four individuals only achieved consensus or agreement um, amongst the four of them 20% of the time in terms of that they made the same observations for the same defects and features in the pipe. And this also accounts for what we already knew would be the case, which is that there would be some slight differences as far as distance uh, points. You know, one operator or one uh, condition assessor might say, that it's 50.2 feet someone else might say no no no, that's 49.5 feet or this is at 12 o'clock versus 11 o'clock in the pipe we knew that, that that those would would be common so we excluded that we're, we're focusing on just the condition codes themselves and across the board across those four individuals only 20 percent of the time uh, at any given point where they agree so coming from there we we realized that you know there there would be a need it might make a difference to uh, develop uh, an artificial intelligence tool to improve uh, you know that current situation that we're in of quite a bit of subjectivity incompleteness people missing codes or lack of agreement lack of reliability or consistency um, before I, I talk more about that just want to get clear with everyone about just some of the basic terminology of artificial intelligence you know what is artificial intelligence um, really all it is is the automation of tasks involving characteristics of human intelligence things like recognizing objects uh, recognizing sounds uh, speech recognition um, but also problem solving and also learning um, and, and machine learning is a subset of AI um, and this is really how you get to AI through machine learning. And this is just the ability to learn, for a computer to learn, without being explicitly programmed. Because theoretically, you could achieve AI without using machine learning, but this would require uh, building millions of lines of code manually with really complex rules and decision trees for each theoretical possible scenario. So instead of hard coding the software program with all these different routines and specific instructions, to accomplish a particular task. Machine learning is a way of training an algorithm 
so that it can learn how on its own. Uh, another way to put it is that instead of giving it the um, all the details of everything, you you tell it um, you know the answer to the question, and then it figures out on its own what kind of question it's answering, and it starts to learn those parameters and those distinctions on its own. So the the training process really just involves feeding the AI uh, huge amounts of data into the algorithm that you construct, and then you allow the algorithm to adjust itself to improve uh, so that it can fulfill on the, the task that, that you're programming it to do. Uh, and you know, machine learning has been used to make drastic improvements to uh, computer vision, okay? Computer vision is the next term we'll talk about. And all this is is really the development of techniques to enable a computer to identify and understand content of digital images, and in our case, photos and videos, okay? Uh, you can gather hundreds of thousands or even millions of pictures and, you know, you actually have to have people tag them or, or label them. Um, you know, for example, humans might tag pictures that have a cat in them versus those that have a dog. Uh, and then the algorithm will try to build a model that can accurately tag uh, a picture as containing a cat or a dog um, or a different object or a different animal. And once the accuracy level is high enough, then the machine has now you know, learned what a cat or a dog looks like. And if you show it new pictures, uh, what you could call test data, it can then make those inferences on that new data set. A little bit of a history lesson about um, our industry and computer vision. Um, it's been attempted before, um, it, you know, close to 20 years ago, actually, in the early 2000s. Um, we saw the introduction of uh, scanning cameras or fish-eyed um, cameras that were designed to, to scan the entirety of a pipe. Some of them even offered a 360-degree field of view. Um, some of these cameras are still widely used and they still exist, and they really do work great a lot of times in terms of producing that type of data, um, and oftentimes at a higher resolution than you normally get. Um, one important thing that these types of scanning or fisheye cameras also do is that they produce an unfolded view of a pipe, um, basically a flat filleted view of the pipe. And a lot of folks um, at that point thought that this was a really good opportunity to start to, um, to try to use uh, computer vision to automatically recognize certain defects. Um, and the method that they employed was called feature classification. This is just based on programming uh, a computer program to identify specific arrangements, very specific arrangements or correlations of different pixels that would, you know, correlate to certain types of defects, such as a fracture, a crack, or, um, you know, a lateral tap opening in the pipe or something like that. They found, though, that while they were able to get it to um, interact effectively with the the training set of data, when they gave it new um, images to, to work on, it was not very effective. Um, they couldn't distinguish defects in data sets that were significantly different from the original test set. So many times pipes have different color materials in them or different lighting conditions or just different uh, operation and maintenance conditions, et cetera. And so you actually do need to have some type of a program that's able to, to work with those inferences um, and deal with uh, slight differences and variations in uh, the data set. So that's where deep learning comes in, um, and, and which is the type of machine learning, deep learning that, that we employed. Uh, so essentially what we, what we did is we um, introduced a, a variety of different algorithms, such as to create uh, what's called a convolutional neural network. So multiple different layers of inferences are being made on the data set. Uh, want to just uh, point out one of the things that we ran into that we thought was interesting was that you have to have clean training data. What I mean by that is um, pictures of defects in the pipe, but that they don't, but that do not have already on-screen uh, labeling information on them. Because that was one of the issues that we ran into is there's tons and tons and tons of pictures and videos that have already been captured um, and assessed in pipes, and unfortunately, a lot of those still pictures and a lot of those videos have an overlay on them because an operator actually found the defect and the way most inspection software works is it'll put an on-screen display with the words of the defect on there. We found that the uh, deep learning machine learning neural networks were so advanced that they were actually able to basically cheat 
um, and read those images and focus then on correlating to the, uh, the, the text on the images versus the important part that we needed it to learn, which was the actual artifact in the image itself, the defect in the image itself. Uh, so when you gave it you know, fresh uh, video or fresh uh, pictures with no uh, previous labeling being done, it wasn't effective. So you know, that, that was something that we, 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 we thought was interesting um, and made a difference for us in terms of the way we trained uh, our AI program. So really the way you do this is you create a very, very large reference library, thousands and thousands. We have somewhere on the magnitude of 200,000 unique and distinct examples of individual defects uh, that we've fed the AI um, and said, these are examples of various different types of defects. So, you know, this is just an example from our web-based uh, platform where, you know, you can look up any number of defects and, and see which ones are currently in the reference library. Uh, to some extent, we can tinker with this as well. And if we find that there's certain examples that aren't great examples, we can eliminate those from the, uh, from the reference library so it doesn't use that um, when it's making its inferences. So the goal behind this you know, endeavor was to really transform condition assessment from the subjective art form that it currently is in into as scientific um, a, a process as possible, as objective as possible. And our autocode uh, program really is the core technology that powers um, all of the products that, that we offer to the market. Um, and what it does is that it automatically codes defects in the pipe for the operator. And we trained it, as I said, using a unique data set of labeled video. And really one of the benefits is that this eliminates the countless hours of daily manual work and all the costs and the time impacts associated with all of that, not to mention um, you know, the, the lack of consistency or reliability that we've experienced from time to time um, in, in the industry as well too. Uh, another important thing to really point out is that uh, this entire process, we are utilizing existing and proven technology. Um, the breakthroughs in computer vision have actually already been around for quite some time, in some cases over 10 years. Um, you know, whether it would be uh, on social media, if you put a picture up and it can automatically recognize your face, sometimes people get a little bit creeped out by that, but that's, uh, you know, very much based on some, you know, uh, computer vision capabilities. Uh, another probably more practical application that many of us may not know about is, um, you know, in the case of uh, Toyota manufactures uh, cars now that have a feature called uh, safety sense. And that's going to be a picture or excuse me, a camera on the front of a bumper uh, with a radar. And if the radar detects that there's an object in front of the bumper, uh, then it's also going to engage with a data set that it has, a reference library of, you know, about a thousand or so or more images that it stores of people, of pedestrians, of cyclists, things like that. So if the, the driver's driving down the road and the radar senses that there's an object and it infers that that object is actually a person, then it'll engage the uh, brakes on the vehicle automatically as a safety precaution to prevent an accident. Okay, so that's a fairly high stakes application for um, you know, automated computer vision. Another um, industry where you know, computer vision has been very well developed and used effectively to a lot of benefit of a lot of people is in the medical field where uh, professionals are able to um, use these tools to assist them in diagnosing uh, people's conditions based on certain scans um, and deciphering and interpreting what those images show uh, so that people don't, uh, so, so that, yeah, people, medical professionals don't miss uh, indicators of uh, cancer and other diseases and things like that. So um, another uh, fairly mature uh, technology that we employed uh, is called OCR, optical character recognition. So the image from a pipe is going to, of course, show the, a defect in a pipe, um, but it also shows on screen a distance readout. So we use this method to obtain a distance value from uh, the images where bounding boxes were drawn. And that's what you see on the screen there, the green box. That's a bounding box that the AI draws around the defect. And anytime it identifies a defect or a possible defect, it's also going to pull that data point of the distance value as well to associate it with the defect. So you have the defect 
and you have the data point. Also, uh, we use the methodology of vanishing point detection in pipe video. So every single pipe video um, has a tiny little dark spot basically in the middle of the pipe where the light doesn't shine, uh, it's too far in front for the camera to really see anything. So we're actually able to detect whereabouts the vanishing point is to help us or help the AI figure out where the camera is being oriented and to help it distinguish whether it's an image showing an axial view of the pipe or a circumferential perspective view of the pipe or not. We also employ that it can recognize um, the water levels or water marks on the sidewalls of the pipe to also help determine which frames are in that type of configuration or not. And if it's a frame that's in an axial view configuration, it's also able to associate the bounding box it's drawing, if there's a defect, with a clock position, which comes into play when we deal with, you know, actually having deliverables that people can use and that are useful. Um, another question that commonly comes up for us when we share about this with folks is continuous defects. Um, so the AutoCode uh, program, it labels defects by individual frame. Okay, so an algorithm needed to be made uh, to enable it to distinguish continuous defects, which is uh, an aspect of NASCO PACP. Basically defects that occur uninterrupted for more than three feet or at three out of four consecutive joints. Um, so it's able to account for when that's occurring versus just producing a report that has, you know, potentially dozens or hundreds of different individual point defects because they showed up on each of those frames. And that's also a method that we employ to, um, you know, individualize point defects uh, in order to prevent the, uh, uh, the, the AI from artificially inflating pipe condition ratings for defects that are actually less than three linear feet. Um, those defects, according to NASCO PACP, should be, you know, individually coded, um, even though in reality, they do appear on multiple frames as, a, as an operator drives up to a defect, it's gonna start noticing it some distance behind, um, et cetera. So we, we took that into account. So the whole point here is to you know, really reduce the cost per day to operate an inspection uh, crew, um, cost per foot to inspect a uh, pipe, cost per linear foot. And we found that uh, utilizing this method can drastically increase the production of crews in the field. While they are expected to you know, stop uh, at least for a moment at every defect or potential defect, and these operators are of course trained um, and certified in the NASCO PACP standard, um, and they're not to exceed uh, 30 feet per minute driving continuously down a pipe, um, we, we were able to eliminate the entire part of the workflow where that operator has to sometimes look through their manual to see which defect they should you know, make the observation for, uh, et cetera. This is just a, a demo showing kind of a post-process uh, videos uh, and various different defects that, that it's identifying in these. Uh, whether it be, you know, joint related defects or roots uh, or structural, uh, you know, fractures in the pipe, broken pipe, things like that. And I'll say a little bit more about the review process too in a second. So you can see that every time it finds a feature or a defect, it draws that bounding box. There's also um, a number associated with it. It might be a little hard to see in the video, but um, that's essentially kind of a confidence score that it's generating. It's saying it thinks it knows what it is, but to what degree, um, and that depends. So that's another aspect of how this all works is that you can make adjustments uh, for what the confidence threshold might be uh, for the AI. Do you want it to detect every possible anomaly or defect, or do you want it to just point out the ones that it's you know, very sure of or not? And so there's advantages and disadvantages to both, which I'll get into in a second now. I wanna have a, a short conversation about how the performance of, of our AI gets measured and, and what we've noticed about it and just some, some kind of important distinctions here. So let's say that you had an image with 11 pets in it and there was eight dogs and three cats. Uh, and you wanted the AI to be able to distinguish the dogs from the cats. Okay, so let's say that the AI identified six of the eight dogs, um, but also it mistook three of the cats for dogs. And you could ask, okay, well, what's the accuracy, right? So that is a term. A lot of folks you kind of, you know, really um, who are lay people would, would ask, you know, with, it's valid. What's the accuracy of the AI? Well, you know, in, in, in this case, the term accuracy 
is really going to answer the question. It's going to answer one question. Uh, what percent of the AI's predictions of dogs were correct? So in this case, there are eight dogs in the data set um, of 11 total animals, and it correctly identified six of the dogs. So its accuracy was only uh, 55%. So you would then ask, okay, well, you could ask, what, what's the precision? Um, so precision attempts to answer a different question. Uh, which is what proportion of positive identifications as dogs were actually dogs. So in this case, it made nine total predictions and six of the nine predictions were correct because it misidentified three cats as dogs. So its precision was 66%. So you can see here, you know, simply going off of precision or even accuracy doesn't really cut it either because, you know, if you look at this entire data set, where there are eight dogs, you know, in addition to mistaking three of the cats for dogs, it also did not identify two of the dogs. So how do we quantify these missed dogs? You would also call those false negatives, by the way. So this is where the term recall comes in, okay? And in recall, in our case, um, this is actually the most important metric that we use because it answers the following question. What proportion of actual positives, actual dogs, uh, was identified correctly as a dog in the data set. And in this case, there are eight dogs and it found six of them. So two of the dogs went unrecognized. So six out of eight is 75%. So the precision, or excuse me, the recall is 75%. And, you know, you might ask, okay, well, why is this guy talking about accuracy, precision, and recall? Well, it really, you know, it matters because, you know, recall is the most relevant metric for our application for sewer defect identification. Because, um, you know, in terms of finding defects in sewer pipes, you definitely don't want to, you know, you don't want it to miss any defects. In the case of major defects, like a hole in the pipe or broken pipe, or even like a cross bore, if it were, if it were to miss those defects, um, it could make the difference between a catastrophic failure uh, or even a sanitary overflow uh, or worse. So this is also consistent with how computer vision and AI is evaluated in the medical field as well. Okay, because you know the impact of a recall error or a breakdown in recall in the medical field for AI would actually be life or death for a patient most of the time. So you know the key is to train the AI to achieve a balance, the right balance between high level of recall and a high level of precision. Um, you know, not missing any defects, but also on the flip side of that, not generating inordinate amounts of false positives for data labelers to address in the review process, because that takes time and labor and there's cost to that as well. So, um, you know, for our purposes, we consider that 90% recall or greater for specific defects or at least groups of defects, um, that would show per effective performance. Uh, and we include a process for a trained and certified data labeler to look at the additional anomalies um, in the pipe that the AI detected, but maybe couldn't distinguish as a specific defect. That would be an example of low, lower precision. So if we were trying to use the AI for a completely automated process, if you were to you know, try and just press a button, uh, send a video to it, press a button and expect to get a complete A to Z report, then you would really demand extremely high precision and it would, that would need to be the case. Um, so it basically needed, would need to be close to 100% precision. So in setting parameters for the AI uh, inferences, you can always make adjustments. You can always um, have it raise or lower its confidence thresholds to increase the recall percentage. But if you do that, you do tend to end up with uh, lower precision and more false positives. So the manual data labelers would need to address that so you do need to find a balance. It's also important to note that, you know, as per the study that I referenced earlier, human recall is only about 80%. And that's currently kind of what we live with in our industry currently, as far as, you know, just defects not being found. And the other thing that's important to note is that there is currently no widely used or agreed upon universal guideline or metric for evaluating quality or reliability of sewer condition assessment reports generated by people. You know, there are guidelines, 
that that exist in you know in industry standards but what we found is that they are generally not very widely used and mostly employed on a, on a specific project specific basis and most operators um, throughout their entire career may not ever need to actually you know uh, be accountable to any of those so we thought that was interesting so Let's talk a little bit about some of the early adopters of this technology and some of the uh, the folks that we've been given the opportunity to use this with. Um, first one would be uh, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. Um, they were in a situation where they had uh, close to a million linear feet of inspection data. Um, it was provided to them by a large gas utility that has been that had been financing a um, cross bore safety uh, program for about the last 10 years. So they were employing a variety of different uh, uh, contractor vendors that were going out and capturing this data in the field using a variety of cameras, push cameras, lateral launch cameras. So they're either accessing these lateral pipes from main lines or uh, accessing them from cleanouts upstream at, at access points closer to buildings. Um, and they had all this video, but because the purpose of that program was purely to identify whether cross bores were present or not in the pipe, no condition assessment was done on that data. The videos were there um, and they knew that inside the videos was valuable information, but for them to code it themselves or to have it coded by a third party manually would have been a pretty astronomical cost. So they, we all thought that this was actually a really good opportunity to, 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 to try out the artificial intelligence technology. So the original scope was to do full NASCO PACP assessment you know, using the full 226 codes, um, you know, assisting uh, people, labelers, um, on the entire data set. And this was about 179 miles or a million linear feet or something like 50,000 or so uh, individual inspections, however you want to look at it. Um, so, you know, we worked with uh, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. We broke this out into four phases. And this was part of a really important, critical part of how we trained the AI. Uh, the first phase was we identified um, seven of what we said were the most important codes for the purposes of this project. Firstly, we wanted to, to do a, an audit to determine if there were potentially any cross bores missed in the data set, but also looking for important structural uh, failures and indicators, broken pipe, um, bad uh, uh, surface damage type of codes, things like that. You can see voids beyond the pipe, things like that. Phase two was um, higher priority operation and maintenance codes. Phase three was more medium severity operation and maintenance codes as well. Um, and then phase four was the remaining uh, 201 codes. Okay, and this uh, was a su successful program. Uh, and it was important to us because it demonstrated that we were able to de-risk this technology because we were able to successfully apply it to a fairly low quality data set. Um, you know, there was a variety of different cameras used, but in general, most folks know that uh, if a camera is small enough to fit into a lateral pipe, you know, four inches or smaller uh, pipe, it generally doesn't have a great field of view, de generally doesn't have good optics compared to a mainline pan and tilt camera, et cetera, plus the process by which the camera traverses up or down these lateral pipes with bends in them is quite um, herky-jerky, a uh, lot of movement, a lot more blurriness to the images, lots of times where the lens is making contact with things in the sewer pipe and becoming dirty. So it was far from ideal data set, you would think. Um, and, you know, it did cause some hurdles for us, but at the end of the day, we were able to get the AI to, you know, to effectively um, identify uh, defects on its own. Um, and we thought this was important um, because it demonstrated that it could also work in more uh, you know, traditional mainline surveys that are of a general higher quality. And the other thing we thought was interesting was that mostly leading up to this, folks in the industry had really assumed that only high definition type of video would be would be possible for an AI to work effectively in. And, and we found that that actually wasn't the case. As long as your algorithms uh, were solid and the data set um, in terms of people labeling the data and feeding it into the reference library, as long as those processes uh, were, were good processes, it could be done. So um, this enabled uh, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission to save about 75% of the projected cost of any other alternative that they had. So when you're dealing with about a million linear feet, um, 
we determined and they determined that it would have taken about 8,800 man hours to review that manually. So depending on the size of your team doing that, that's gonna take you anywhere from two years to 10 years um, you know, of full time uh, working every single work day. That's not feasible. And by the time they would have finished that project, most of that data may not have even been useful anymore. Some of it could have been as old as 20 years by then. So we were able to complete the task quite quickly relative to that and now the utility has data to plan its maintenance and rehabilitation projects so that's one example of use on legacy data and archival data um, this is a, another early adopter but this focuses more on data collection for ongoing projects so um, pipe and plant solutions and full disclosure one of the founders of sewer ai also owns pipe and plant solutions so this was um, this is a uh, San Francisco Bay Area based company. Um, the you know the the sales process for this uh, opportunity was pretty basic. You know, owner of the company says, "Hey, you guys are going to start using this now," and it's been awesome to have the opportunity to have people um, on the ground, basically beta testing this, um, where they're still doing all the same workflows as far as how they capture the data in the field, um, and all the operators are are you know experienced PACP certified operators. But instead of plugging in each observation in real time, they brought the data back to us uh, and we ran our inferences on it. And they have, have found approximately about a 200% production increase as a result of employing this method. So it's made a massive difference in terms of just you know, cash flow for the company, production for the company, also morale for the crew. They, they, they tend to get excited about being able to have those types of metrics. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So this all occurs inside of our inspection management platform, which is a web-based uh, platform. Uh, so uh, really anybody with a login credential and the ability to open a Google Chrome browser can open their browser with an internet connection log in and the data is hosted by us on the platform and then the data streams for the user and they can review all of the inspections make changes to specific codes eliminate codes and things like that um, and the way that it prompts the reviewer is such that um, they're no longer needing to look at clean pipe um, or wait for entire you know videos to play out in real time or, or themselves messing with, uh, re, you know, rewind, fast forward. I mean, they can rewind uh, on any point, but it'll show them first the still bounding box, uh, and then it's linked to the playback in the video. And so the reviewer can then say, yes, I agree with the AI's, uh, you know, call out here, or no, uh, or make a slight change to it, et cetera. So that's one way that you can use it. Um, another way that, that this is done is, is by, by us in-house as basically labeling as a service, where we will take on, on all those processes ourselves and we'll provide um, a full complete deliverable yeah, as a third party, uh, kind of a more traditional type of workflow. Um, but we found that both can be beneficial depending on you know, the organization and what their needs are. So the process is pretty simple. Uh, upload the data. Uh, in the case of pipe and plant services, they are doing this pretty much in real time. They have um, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots on their uh, trucks and they start the upload process as soon as they uh, you know, uh, save the video um, and save the inspection, that goes up. It could be done alternatively where the trucks are parked um, you know, at night at the, at the facility uh, or something like that. Doesn't matter too much, but the point is they get uploaded to the cloud, to the inspection management platform. Then the autocode inferences are run on the data set and then the user can then access the inspections. So uh, just to kind of break it down to be clear about the AI assisted condition assessment process, um, the uploaded video is then given to the auto code uh, and the inferences are initiated on it. From there, the manual review process starts and uh, that's being evaluated by a trained and certified individual labeler. And they'll ask the question, was this defect correctly labeled, yes or no? Uh, if yes, then that goes into the condition assessment report. If no, then the corrections are made or the deletion is made. And then whatever change then goes into the condition assessment report. And by and large, uh, when we're doing that ourselves, um, we tend to feed all that uh, labeled data back into the reference library to expand the reference library so that over time it's only getting better because it has more and more examples to draw from, the autocode does, when it's then making new inferences. So it sort of improves exponentially over time. So um, the AI assisted condition assessment process is also a, a, a pretty stark increase in production we found. 
uh, most reviewers can complete around 2,500 linear feet, sometimes 3,000 linear feet per hour um, that they're doing this. And it really, that's mostly accomplished by the fact that it eliminates the need to watch video of clean, good condition pipe. Okay, it only prompts them to interact with anomalous parts of the inspection or defective parts of the pipe or, or specific construction features that need to be noted anyway. Um, the autocode uh, program, that inference speed is, you know, miles ahead. Uh, it's it's 30,000 linear feet per hour is essentially what it's able to accomplish um, as, a, as a software program. And that varies slightly depending on uh, the resolution of the images and things like that. But uh, mostly it's, it's around 35,000 linear, 30,000 linear feet per hour or more. So what is the inspection management platform? How does that work? Um, well, in some, in some regards, it's not terribly different than, than you know, other, uh, other types of uh, inspection software out there. Uh, the main thing about it is, is that it's all hosted on the web. And there is no aspect of it that involves anybody um, else installing any program on any particular machine, or there's no dongle or USB to manage uh, with a license on it or anything like that. The, the way the licensing works is people are, are you know, getting login credentials, um, and it can be done based off of the number of users that they want and or the number of linear feet that they would need the autocode inferences to be run on. So it allows for them to harness the power of the AI. So there's about six, six different aspects of it. Um, a dashboard, uh, project status, the autocode itself and the defect labeling, uh, a, a couple different integrations, which we'll talk about. There's a field portal, and that really applies to folks that are executing projects that are they're collecting data. Um, and then there's data analytics. So um, the dashboard is really just a customizable interface where you can set up hot buttons and it can really be tailored to whatever your role is in the organization. Maybe you're a project manager, maybe you're a data labeler, or, or maybe you're an engineer and someone that just wants to see the finished uh, reports and things like that and make decisions off of it. Project status, um, really relevant to you know, fleet managers, project managers, foremen, things like that. Um, this is all basically where you can see in real time, um, you know, geolocated data about the crews and what they've done, what they haven't done yet. And you can really start to understand how many feet have been completed, what the estimated completion date might be based on that type of production metric um, and production per shift, per pipe, per size, per operator. Uh, in terms of integrations, uh, we are in the uh, Esri partner network. So that allows for different shapefile transfers and we have transfers and we have access to the resources in that network as far as doing those different types of integrations of um, you know uh, GIS uh, uh, layers, map layers. Um, in terms of uh, NASCO PACP, we are members of NASCO. Currently we're in the process of uh, getting certified in terms of import and export. So this is completely separate from any conversation about evaluation of the AI and autocode, which I talked about earlier. This is purely to demonstrate that we can successfully import and export uh, NASCO uh, compliant uh, databases, uh, et cetera, and that the fields all line up and all that. Um, and then also we've, we've had a lot of success so far with custom software integrations for several different inspection software vendor formats. Um, in addition to that, we've uh, been able to integrate with the 360 degree digital scanning cameras as well. This is just an example of one of them, which is basically giving you the ability to virtually sort of move around inside of the pipe. You can also see an unfolded view as well. And again, this is all being done based off of a streaming web browser type of uh, format. And the operator or the reviewer can make additional observations and change them and they can manually code the report as well too if they wanted. Um, the customer portal, uh, this may be more relevant to uh, uh, services contractors out there, um, but this is a, a way to share the, uh, the end results, the, uh, the deliverables uh, with the, uh, the different stakeholders in the projects. Okay, so we'll host all the data that then can stream. And if you're a contractor and you finish the project, or you finished one inspection, you can send an email notification to a stakeholder and they can click that link and it'll bring them up to the web page where they can then start to stream the video, see the PDF reports, download those if they need, and et cetera, et cetera. And really just speeds up, accelerates the process of 
getting the you know completed data into the hands of the people who need it much much quicker as opposed to uh, you know even using like Dropbox and having them uh, you know download it or you know driving out to their physical location on premises and handing over a USB stick or something like that. So if you're a services company and you're looking at ways this could impact or speed up your accounts receivable timeline, this is one way an opportunity to do that. Um, from an analytics standpoint of the data, um, there, it's a twofold. Uh, type of benefit. One is you can start to see where it makes a difference in project execution, uh, services companies especially, but also organizations, agencies that are interested in understanding their production or where there might be opportunities to train and develop certain operators. This is one way to do it, um, where you can really start to see production rates by pipe size, pipe type, operator, manufacturer of equipment, uh, truck type, software type, the geography or the weather that day, and you really can start to get a feedback loop for where your operators are effective and maybe where they're not effective yet. And also as a services company that actively engages in bidding your work, you can really start to get reliable metrics for that bid uh, to be you know, something that you could hang your hat on a little bit better than how it currently is, which is sometimes guesswork um, I've seen. Um, from analytics, you also can, there's, there's a few benefits. We're kind of scratching the surface here uh, with this, but one thing that we, we know that we can um, do uh, currently is uh, you know, some decision support. And what we mean by that is defect cluster analysis. So basically you can identify and quantify specific clusterings of um, specific defects or also different um, related defects that are in close proximity to each other. Uh, PACP is great and it gives you a condition rating that is, that is for that entire pipe segment. One of the things it doesn't do very well always is give people insights about where there might be specific points in the pipe that are of a concern. And it can show the distribution of these defects and how clustering um, can you know, reveal certain types of deterioration mechanisms or patterns um, in the system. And also it's a, it can be sometimes an, an easy, a straightforward way to um, provide people with uh, uh, insights about whether or not this is a candidate for a full length reline or whether perhaps instead you could accomplish uh, a repairs uh, with just sectional point repairs um, and, and spot repairs instead. So there can be a lot of cost savings there if you're looking to optimize uh, you know, a limited budget or a limited capability with a crew, uh, you can start to find those opportunities or kind of that low hanging fruit for repair. So really everything that we've been trying to do is, is coming from a place of how can we reduce costs for all the people involved, especially for the agencies and for the rate payers, but also for the services contractors, et cetera. And also how can we accelerate the production of this data and, and increase the accuracy and the quality of it? So reducing costs, um, accelerating production and really increasing accuracy and quality, quality of it. So really, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, from that standpoint, um, the AutoCode AI, the inferences are based off of previous work done on millions and millions of feet of inspections um, and can really solidly eliminate the risk posed by missing defects. And it can create a very solid foundation upon which you can do quite quite a few other analytics off of and predictive modeling and decision support, but but to have a really solid foundation of very consistent level of, uh, of data can be helpful. Um, some of the applications and uses for this would include, um, you know, QAQC of CCTV submittals. One of the first things that we do with data sets when we ingest them is we'll run some inferences just on the, the overall quality of it, specifically, how much of the video is the camera underwater? How much of the video is the camera traversal speed too quick? Um, is how much is blurry? And if it doesn't meet certain thresholds, oftentimes we won't run further inferences on it because what's the point? Garbage in, garbage out. So um, just you know, some basic uh, you know uh, tasks like that can can really make a difference from a standpoint of uh, QAQC of submittals. Also, operator training and development, um, really identifying specific. Uh, you know, learning opportunities where you can start to see maybe certain operators don't like certain codes or don't know about certain codes that really they should be using more. You can really pinpoint that and show them, uh, you know, here's here's what you said, here's what we say, and, and really developing people um, in that way. Also database conversion, or you could say condition assessment of legacy archival data. Um, you know, there's a lot of 
uh, agencies out there that have had inspection programs for decades, but maybe only recently, like in the last couple of years, have they engaged with like a PACP type of program and implemented it. Well, that past data that they already have is not useless and it could really be um, utilized instead to, to give you kind of time-based benchmarks or comparison, or you can start to chart out, you know, to what extent is the system deteriorating over time because you have those past data points. Um, also for cross-bore utility conflicts, you can do safety audits just to make sure, give an assurance that no cross-bore was actually missed by the operators. Um, and, and of course, that's a safety hazard if it does come up, um, if, if you know someone had mistakenly uh, drilled a gas line into someone's side sewer and, and the camera may have not picked that up uh, in real time. The operator may have not picked that up, I mean. Another thing is to increase the speed of data collection in the field. And whether you're trying to uh, capture, you know, the cost uh, or profitability benefits from that, or if you're just a city or, or engineering firm that's just interested in getting access to that information quicker than you would normally. Um, there's a lot of project management tools as well uh, that you can use this for, but also from an analytics standpoint, um, project execution analytics, but also asset management and decision support analytics. Um, it can make a big difference in. Um, finally, just want to introduce just a uh, possible ancillary application. What I mean by that is um, we we ran um, autocode inferences on a data set of jetter camera footage. So this is a battery operated camera that literally screws onto the front of a vacuum jetter nozzle and the operator is going to clean the pipe and the camera is going to capture video during that process. Traditionally how this data gets used is the operator with like a Bluetooth uh, and a tablet will be able to view that um, footage, you know, while they're still set up at the access point, and they're going to see whether did I, did I clean the pipe or not, or do I need to put a specialty nozzle in, et cetera. And that data is traditionally not being used for condition assessment at all. But in this type of instance, um, because all it really needs is one really good frame uh, to make a call out and to draw a bounding box um, and capture, you know, some data. Well, we can do that with it. So it's not uh, on the level of a NASCO PACP deliverable because there's no distance readout and the camera is fixed. Uh, it might be self-leveling, but it's not able to pan and tilt and the camera's really not stopping while they're recording it. But you can get actionable information uh, from this. And this would be you know, something like a $15,000 nozzle um, that can sometimes get you what you might otherwise require a $200,000 or $350,000 camera truck to have to go out and capture separately. So just to enable uh, agencies or contractors to get more out of limited resources is something that we're definitely interested in and most of the folks in this industry are always looking out for anyway. So we see that as a possible new application for this as well. And really that was all I wanted to share at this time. Um, more than happy to answer questions that anybody might have. As you can see, my contact info is on there too. And feel free to reach out to me directly as well. We're, we're happy to talk to people in more detail about this. And we're also happy to do uh, trials for folks, uh, whether it be sending us data that we can run inferences on and give you an idea of its effectiveness or provide folks with trials to access the inspection management platform um, to, uh, to use it themselves as well too, uh, either way. Um, it, it can be beneficial. So we, we operate in kind of a two-pronged approach. We'll either do labeling as a service uh, for folks, or we will allow uh, folks or stakeholders to have access to the inspection management platform so that they can use the power of AI for themselves uh, as they see fit. And thank you so much.